Hello friends, welcome back to another edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. My name is Ryan Day, and as always, we are so thrilled to have you at home all around the world joining us at this time, this special hour of study. We consider you a part of this family. We consider you a part of the panel because without you, we wouldn't be here, right? We wouldn't be doing this program without you. So thank you for your continual love, prayers, and support of 3ABN Ministry. And uh, this week, lesson number six, as we're making our way through a study in the crucible with Christ. Mm -hmm. Lesson number six is entitled Struggling with All Energy. It's going to be an exciting one and I would like to take the moment before we go any further to introduce our special, special panel. To my direct left is Miss Shelley Quinn. How are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed to be here and my day is the divine human combination. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord. Pastor James Rafferty, always a blessing to have you, brother. Always good to be here. I have Tuesday's lesson which is entitled The Disciplined Will. Amen. Amen. Exciting. And to your left is Pastor John Loma King, brother. Mine is off the chain because it's called radical commitment. What does that mean? Stay tuned. <laughs> All right. <laughs> radical. All right. And then, of course, down at the far end of the table, Pastor John Denzi, always a blessing to have you, my brother. It's a blessing to be here. I have Thursday, the need to persevere. All Amen. right. Praise the Lord. Struggling with all energy. I don't think that any of us uh, is going to deny that sometimes our walk with the Lord, probably because of our own, uh, more of on our own part than anything else, but oftentimes we find ourselves struggling. We find ourselves in a challenging situation where it seems hard to persevere. And I know we're going to talk about that. Uh, but before we pray, I just want to read our opening memory text, which comes from Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. I'm going to read the NIV and then I'll also read the uh, King, New King James version as well. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 29 coming from the NIV and it says, To this end I strenuously contend, struggling with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I guess that's where they got the, the, the title from right there. Struggling with all energy uh, struggling with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I like that. New King James Version, uh, same, same verse, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. To this end I also labor, Paul writes, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. Amen. Praise the Lord for that truth. And on that note, I would like to ask Michelle Quinn if you'd have a prayer for us. I'd love to. Our loving Heavenly Father, we ask now for that energy. We ask for the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask to be emptied of self, filled with you, and let your Holy Spirit be our teacher. Mm -hmm. And we pray for your blessing on all who are hearing our voices, that, Father, that we will all learn together. We praise you and thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Sabbath afternoon study actually opens with uh, a rather interesting scenario, a story, but uh, talks about two guests that were on a talk show host, or excuse me, on a talk show. And uh, these two guests were in two drastic situations, but yet similar. Both had lost a child in their life. Uh, the woman who lost her son that had been murdered 20 years before. It goes on to describe her as, you know, she was angry, she was bitter, uh, full of hate in her heart. But yet the gentleman that was on this same program with her, uh, he was totally different. Uh, his daughter had been murdered by terrorist a few years earlier. He spoke about forgiveness toward the killers and about how God had transformed his, his heart and also his hurt towards them. Uh, however terrible and painful this this lesson brings out. However terrible the pain, this man had become an illustration of how God can bring healing to the darkest moments of our life. Ain't that the truth? Mm. And I think many of us can, are, we're, we're obviously a witness for that. We're an example mm. of that. But it also brings out this. It says, how can two people respond so differently? How does spiritual change occur in the life of a Christian? Mm. Enabling that individual to mature through life's crucibles rather than being completely overwhelmed by them. I think right now if I was at home watching this, I'd be screaming into the television going, yeah, that's what I want to know. I want to know how, how can we gain that victory? How can we mm -hmm. have that spiritual maturity mm -hmm. to be able to take on these crucibles rather than to be and make it through them rather than allow them to overwhelm us and overcome us. That sets us up for Sunday's lesson, uh, which I'm, I was so happy to have because it's entitled The Spirit of Truth. The spirit of truth. I like that. Uh, and it, the lesson opens up saying, have you ever prayed 
Please, God, make me good. I can raise... <laughs> That's me, right? I, I have prayed that, Lord, change me. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, make me whole. Make me more like you. And, and oftentimes in life, we, we, when, we're, when we're struggling through something, uh, maybe it's a character flaw. Maybe it's a, a lifestyle practice of whatnot. Maybe we, I find myself sometimes saying, Lord, oh, I'm struggling with this. God, help me overcome. But it doesn't come necessarily sometimes the way we uh, expect it to. That victory mm-hmm. doesn't always come in the way that sometimes when we read in the Word of God, it makes it sound sounds so simple. It's just calling out on the Lord and you Mm -hmm. shall be saved. You know, asking the Lord and he will make you whole. But the lesson brings this out. Powerful point. And it kind of just, just perfectly sets us up for Sunday's lesson. It says why. One reason is, in other words, why uh, does it seem like that that victory doesn't come immediately? Or why Mm. does it seem like we persevere through those crucibles as quick or as swift as we might hope for? And it says one reason is disturbingly simple. While the spirit has unlimited power to transform us, it is possible by our own choices to restrict what God can do. Amen. But wait a second, Ryan, God's all powerful. God can do anything. We just ask and his spirit will, will, you know, move mountains. His spirit can make the world come into existence, yeah. but it can't change me. Well, it can, but maybe there's something that we are doing to prevent the working of the Holy Spirit in our life. I want to jump over to John chapter three, and we start to see the foundational importance of having the Holy Spirit in our life. This is a life or death situation, my friends. I just want to make that clear. This is not some little mealy needy little topic that we we just skim over and, and think that we can get by without the working of the Holy Spirit in our life. John chapter 3 makes it very clear that we need the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit working in us to prepare us for the kingdom of God. In fact, right there, as Jesus is having his conversation with Nicodemus, starting in verse 3. So John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Mm. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And then Jesus brings to light the situation. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Mm. And then verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Powerful point there. We need the Holy Spirit. We have to be born of the Holy Spirit in order to even be able to enter the kingdom of God. So is this a serious topic? Is this something that we need to consider? Absolutely. I found this rather interesting quote here from Homeward Bound, page 88, referring to what we had just read and the topic of the Holy Spirit. It says here, Here is declared the same truth that Jesus had revealed to Nicodemus when he said, Except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Not by seeking a holy mountain or a sacred temple are people brought into communion with heaven. Religion is not to be conformed to external forms or ceremonies. The religion that comes from God is the only religion that will lead to God. In order to serve Him aright, it says, we must be born of the divine spirit, the spirit of truth. It says, this will purify the heart and renew the mind, giving us a new capacity for knowing the loving God. It will give us a willing obedience to all his requirements. This is true worship. It is the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit, every sincere prayer is indicted. And such prayer is is acceptable to God. Whether a soul reaches out after God, there the Spirit's working is manifest, and God will reveal Himself to the soul. For such worshipers He is seeking. He waits to receive them and to make them His sons and daughters. Now that's a beautiful reality, but often we find ourselves in a situation in which we're doing exactly what Paul counseled us not to do. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, when he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed and for the day of redemption. We know that that's important. Also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19, he says, Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Are we quenching the Holy Spirit in our life? Are we grieving away the work of the Holy Spirit in our life? My friends, this is, this is salvational. This is huge. And we go on to learn that it's the Holy Spirit's job to bring us in communion with God. It's, he's referred to as the Spirit of Truth. 
And so we find in John chapter 14, verse 26, uh, notice what the Bible says here. John chapter 14. In fact, we're going to be in John 14 and John 16 in the closing time that we have. If you want to turn there. So John 14 and John 16. But John 14, verse 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things things that I have said to you. Now, here's what's amazing. That's a promise from Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave here. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to do this, 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 and this. And we're going to read on through chapter 16 and see what all those things are. But a part of this is that the Holy Spirit is in the business of leading and guiding us and teaching us all things. But why isn't that all people have been taught all things? Because there is something in our life, maybe our choices, mm. maybe some rebellion there that is preventing the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth to mm. do the divine work in our life mm. that, we, that we need. Mm -hmm. Go on to John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. Notice what it says here. I'm going to read, start reading in verse 5. It says, but now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now notice verse 8 here. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now for the sake of time, let's skip down to verse 13. Because right where this, he's going to convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But notice verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And I'm going to kind of pull a little bit here from the book of Loma King, if you don't mind me, Pastor. Uh, I learned from Pastor Loma King, and I find this application to be very truthful in the sense that the Holy Spirit wants to do all of these things in our life. But he, but he works, he, he, there's three aspects to the working of the Holy Spirit. He wants to work on us. Mm -hmm. He wants to work in us. And he wants to work through us. But oftentimes we prevent that working, my friends, because of choices in our life. Why do we have to endure these crucibles? Why does it seem like we're white knuckling our way through, but we can't seem to gain the victory? Oftentimes it's not because God doesn't want to come through or God is preventing it, but oftentimes it's our choices. Lord, I, I don't want this, and I'm just using this as an example, certainly not trying to offend, but Lord, I don't want this lung cancer anymore, but rather, you know, have you put down the cigarettes? Sometimes it's choices in our lives that prevent prevent the Holy Spirit from giving us the victory that we need. That's why based on that truth that the Holy Spirit is working on everyone, but he wants to work in us and also through us. That's why Acts chapter 5 verse 32 says, and we are his witnesses to these things. And so also the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Ryan, I want to obey him. Then all we have to do is surrender our will to him. Remember what Jesus said in the garden, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Wonderful foundation. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. And let me see if I could match your energy. I'm Shelley Quinn and we have for lessons, Monday's lesson, the divine human combination. If you have your Bibles, you might want to open to Colossians chapter one because that's, we're basically going to stay in Colossians one the entire time. What Colossians one is revealing is the divine human combination, God who became a human being and then the divine human combination in each of his followers. Now, Paul did not start the church at Colossia, but when Epaphras brought him a good report about what was going on, Paul wrote to the Colossians and we're going to begin chapter 1, verse 9, Colossians 1 and verse 9. He's heard this report of their faith and their love and their hope in Christ. And Paul writes in Colossians 1, 9, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Hey, parents, that's a great prayer mm -hmm. to pray for your children, isn't mm -hmm. it? And he goes on saying why he's praying that you may walk worthy of the Lord. It's only as we are filled with the knowledge of God's will, filled with that heavenly wisdom and spiritual understanding that we can walk 
worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Now, how do we walk worthy of the Lord and please Him? Paul's about to list four things. He says, being fruitful in every good work. So the performance of Christian service, good deeds, that's bearing fruit in the Lord. Then Paul adds, increasing in the knowledge of God. Continuous spiritual growth will increase your appetite, your love mm -hmm. for the study of Scripture. If you don't love to study the Scripture, pray and ask God and say, Lord, help me to love your Word because that's how you get to know Him. Then Paul continues in verse 11. So being fruitful is the first way to walk worthy of Him. Um, increasing in the knowledge of God, that pleases God. But verse 11, he says, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. So it's the full dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is how we endure our trials. Then the fourth thing is, he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So we need to express gratitude to God in all things, in all situations. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, when I get really down, you know, if you're in a lot of pain and you can't do something, what I do is I'll thank God and say, well, thank you that I can still walk. Thank you that I can still think. Thank right. you that whatever. And then verse 13, he said, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of sins. Now, before we go to the next verse, watch what Paul does. He is going to talk about Christ's supremacy as our Creator and our Redeemer. He's in the very form, fully God. And so when, when He came here to manifest the presence of God in the flesh, this is who Jesus Christ is. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God. He's a representation of God in human flesh. He is the firstborn over all creation, for by Him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him, through Christ Jesus mm -hmm. and for Him. And He is before all things because He's not a created being. And in Him all things consist. It's by the word of His mm -hmm. mighty power that He holds everything together. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have preeminence. Now, I have to just mention the title firstborn. When He said He is the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn of the dead, this does not mean that Jesus was created. How can our creator of all things be created? It's impossible to be both. Firstborn means preeminence or it's a preeminence in rank or in time. It's a covenant term that gives Christ priority. He is supreme over all the created order. So let's look at verse 19, first, uh, Colossians. Colossians 1, 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. Now this is highlighting Christ's divinity. The entirety of God's being was in Him. He was fully divine and fully human. And by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross, and verse 21 says, You who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled. He's done more than forgive you. He's brought you back into relationship with God. He did this in the body of His flesh through death. Now this is highlighting Christ's humanity in the body of His flesh. And then He says, He did this to present you holy. 
Mm. That just simply means to present you separated from sin, that we are set apart by the righteousness of Christ Jesus and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, that's important. You can't just begin and change your mind and expect to be saved. You've got to continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Verse 27, I love verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, mm -hmm. the hope of glory. Right. What is God's glory? It's his character. How do we develop his character? It's as Christ is in us. And you know, Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 says that it is when the Holy Spirit is in us, as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, Christ dwells in our hearts by <coughs> faith. And the indwelling spirit is our hope and our guarantee of becoming like him. And verse 28, he goes on, he says, Him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect. That means mature. Mm -hmm. And you're perfect at every stage of your growth as you're maturing. That's right. Perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 29, to this end, I also labor, mm. striving according to his divine working, which works in me mightily. Here's the divine human combination in us. God fills us with his spirit. Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works in us to will and to do his good purpose. But the balance of Christian living is we receive the Holy Spirit, God mm -hmm. empowers us, but we must take action. God's never going to coerce you. He's not going to do anything to force you. He works in us to will. He lines up our will with his will as we read the word and we understand and we think, oh yeah, but you know what? It is not till we take a step of action that actually the Holy Spirit begins to work in us beyond changing our thoughts. We got to step out in faith and the power of the Holy Spirit will show up. God's plan is total dependence upon him. Mm -hmm. And Paul's saying here that God empowered him to labor and it, God empowered Paul to work to the point of exhaustion. Mm. And I think that's so interesting because we know Paul had a lot of opposition, but I have to point out, this doesn't mean that we're striving for salvation. There's no amount of good works that we could do to earn salvation, but to become mature, we have to strive against pride, against selfishness and sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 13 says this, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. Mm -hmm. So it is the Holy Spirit working in us, but mm -hmm. it's if by the Spirit you put to death, we got to cooperate. Right. It's that divine human combination right. that is the answer. Amen. Right. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that insightful lesson, Shelly. And we don't want you going anywhere because we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. At this time, we're going to kick it over to Pastor James Rafferty for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much. We have uh, the title, The Disciplined Will for mm -hmm. Tuesday's lesson. And really, this is uh, a kind of an understanding of how our feelings play into our Christian experience and how many times our feelings get us in hot water. Our yep. feelings kind of bring the crucibles, bring the trials because we go by our feelings instead right. of going by the Word of God. So 
The lesson starts out by saying one of the greatest enemies of our wills is our own feelings. We are increasingly living in a culture bombarded with pictures and music that can appeal directly to our senses, triggering our emotions and anger and fear and lust without even realizing it. You know, you, you can watch something on YouTube, you can see a little video or this and that and the other, and all of a sudden you're feeling all of these feelings and emotions, and pretty soon you're, you're thinking a certain way, and it has nothing to do with anything that's actually in the Word of God. We're just being, being bombarded. In fact, in the book of Revelation chapter 16, it talks about this in relationship to the battle of Armageddon and how Satan is uh, like frogs, like the frogs of Egypt. He's everywhere. The three unclean spirits are everywhere and they're bombarding us and drawing us toward his side in this battle, this contest between heaven and earth. And so the lesson goes on to say, uh, now how often do we think such things as what do I feel like eating for supper? Mm. What, do I, what do I feel like eating for supper? I don't know, honey. What do you feel like eating? I don't know what to eat. What do you feel like eating? Do you want to eat this? Oh, I don't feel like eating that. I, I feel like eating pizza. I don't know. What do I feel like doing today? What do I feel good? Ab do I feel good about buying this? Feelings have thus become intimately involved in our decision making, right? So we're making these decisions. A lot of times we're basing them on our feelings. Feelings are not necessarily bad. Well, we don't want to completely eliminate feelings. Feelings have a place. God made us to be feeling creatures. He made us to use our senses and our feelings. And, you know, every once in a while, you know, I don't have a good feeling about this, right? I'm not, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about this. That can be very helpful. Right. So we've got to allow feelings to have a place. So the, the lesson quarterly goes on to say, they're not necessarily bad, but how I feel about something may have little to do with whether it is right or best. Indeed... Our feelings can lie to us. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things yes. and desperately wicked, right? Who can know it? And it can create, our feelings can create a false picture of reality, causing us to make bad choices, setting us up for a crucible of our own making. All right, so what examples can we find in the Bible, the quarterly goes on to say, where people made choices based on feelings rather than on God's word, and what were the consequences? And they give three examples, and we're going to look at those three examples just lightly. The first one is in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, right? And this is the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, basically the woman and the serpent are engaging in a conversation about the fruit of a certain tree that God told us not to eat. Do not eat of that tree. In the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely what? Die. die. And the serpent says, you're not really going to die. Look at this fruit. It's absolutely delicious. Look at me. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm talking and, and you'll be just like God if you would just consider this. In fact, just touch it. Just touch it. And so she touches it, you know, and she sees it. And you can imagine the feel. Be like God. I'm not going to surely die. All of these emotions, all these feelings are sourcing through her brain. And the next thing you know, what does she do? She eats the fruit. Mm. I'm not going to say it was an apple. I'm just going to say she eats the fruit, right? And the next thing you know, Adam is in with her. Why? Because he looks at his wife. She's so beautiful. They're just together. They're connected. They're one. Like, I can't even imagine. I can't even, it doesn't, there's no way that, that I'm supposed to be without her. It just doesn't feel right that we're separated. It doesn't feel right. The word of God could have been trusted. God could have done a million things for Adam at that point. Right. But no, he goes by the emotions, by the feelings. And the next thing you know, they're in it together. And God comes. God comes on the scene. God wants to investigate the situation. And he comes looking for them. And as he comes looking for them, of course, what are they doing? They're hiding. hiding. Why are they hiding? Yeah. Because they feel like they are afraid of God. They're just right. scared of him. They're right. like, oh, he's going to take us out, right? God said we were going to die in that day. And he's probably going to enforce mm. the death decree upon us. So these feelings is where we all started going downhill. And now through the process of allowing our feelings to overwhelm at times, our will, our clear choice based on the word of God, all these feelings surge through us and tell us that we're to do something different than what God has actually said. Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11 is the next reference the quarterly gives. And it's, of course, the incidents with David and Bathsheba. And you can imagine, you know, David is a man after God's own heart. He's just been a stalwart for, for decades. He's been faithful to God. Oh, he's had his slips here and there. But now he is alone. He's without his army. Uh, his troops are out in the field. He goes out, sees this woman bathing, 
and his feelings and his emotions, his thoughts, all of that overwhelm him and he does the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. He ends up in this relationship, this illicit relationship, and only so, but in order to cover this up because he feels like, you know, I don't want to get caught, I don't want to be embarrassed. He feels like, oh no, what's going to happen to all this? All these feelings are dictating what he needs to do. And finally, he is confronted by Nathan the prophet through a story and again God reaches his heart and God is always seeking to reach our hearts, to reach our wills, to reach our thought processes that have been at times overwhelmed with these feelings. The next example, the third one is in Galatians chapter 2. Just a summary here again, Peter um, he's sitting with the you know, Gentiles, he's ministering to the Gentiles, he's been given a, a ministry to the Gentiles, you know, he's given a vision of a sheet with all these different animals and it was a sim symbolic of his ministry to the Gentiles. You know, the Jews show up and all of a sudden he does an about turn. You know, he feels a little bit like embarrassed or a little intimidated or whatever, you know, you're out in the airport and you're traveling to St. Louis back home and you're there and you know you're eating your meal and you're sitting down to eat your meal and, and all these people are around you and you aren't sure if you should pray or not, you know, because what are they going to think of you, right? What are they going to think of you? And so you say, well, please bless this food. <laughs> And you start eating, right? right? We, Peter was in a situation where he felt a little bit embarrassed, right? Oh, and then he just kind of plays the hypocrite, you know? No one knows he's a Christian. Does, do people know you're a Christian when you travel for the Lord? Do people know you're a Christian when you're in your business? Do people know you're a Christian wherever you go? Are the things that you wouldn't necessarily do in public because you're not quite, you know, comfortable, your feelings, how are they going to think about me? This is where we are bombarded in our Christian experience. And so, Paul gives Peter a little bit of rebuke, you know, kind of straightens him out a little bit. He gets back mm -hmm. on track. You know, Peter went through that before when he denied his Lord, right? He's in there right. with the campfire with a guy and he doesn't want to feel like he's the odd one out. And they say, oh, you were decide? Oh, no, no. He just feel the mm. fe feelings overwhelm us at times. Mm -hmm. And so important for us to recognize that Jesus Christ came to defeat those feelings. Right. And he did that in Gethsemane specifically. He did it in many places. But in, in Matthew chapter 26, just referencing it now, three times he felt like he wanted this cup to be passed from him mm. three times. Yeah. And of course, he, he didn't just feel like it, like I just don't feel like, you know, he felt it like I'm being separated, like bl blood, like sweating blood, like pain, like agony, like mm. pulling apart from the one he'd been with for all eternity. And he overcame those feelings. He overcame the feelings and he made a decision of the will. Not my will, but thy will be done. Not once, not twice, mm -hmm. but three times. Jesus Christ prayed that prayer right. in our behalf to strengthen us. The lesson ends with 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. We're going to read this verse. 1 Peter 1, 13. Considering everything now, and, and really if you looked at the first part of 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, it would be a summary basically of a lot of what we've covered. It's a summary of the plan of salvation, the context of everything the prophets have written in the context of what God is calling us to. And then he's kind of saying, wherefore, based on all of this, everything we've just talked about, gird up the loins of your mind. This is King James uh, mm -hmm. verbiage. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, the revelation of Jesus Christ isn't just in the last book of the Bible. The revelation of Jesus Christ is everywhere in the Bible. It's right. the yeah. revelation of Jesus Christ. So gird up, that means to bind about like with a belt, right? It, it, belts keep our clothes up. You know, Belts keep us covered. Belts keep us protected. You know, protect the loins, the procreative power, the, 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 the mind, the deep thought and its exercise. Protect your mind and your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions. Protect all of that. Be sober. That actually means to abstain from wine. Why? Well, because alcohol Im impacts our ability to, to think deep for a deep thought. Uh, it cuts off the, the blood circulation to the brain. And hope, that is joyous expectation, have this, have this hope to the very end. Don't waver. Have this hope to the very end because you are going to see Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the disclosure of Jesus Christ, not just as His second coming. You are going to see the revelation of Jesus Christ when you gird up, when you protect your mind and your heart, when you get into the Word of God, when you connect with the Lord in prayer, you're going to, when you meditate on the Word of God, you're going to see a revelation of Jesus Christ and that's what God wants for each one of us. Hey, that's right, yeah, which leads glory. us now to radical commitment. There Thank you, you for the foundation. <laughs> Radical commitment. Radical, that means beyond ordinary, yeah. out of the ordinary, not anything that is in harmony, harmony with your natural desire. Mm. Christians have to get away 
from the feelings. Mm -hmm. We've got to get to the spiritual because there's a battle between what we want to do and what we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. I think that in one of our lesson studies, we talked about the commitment of Christ. A radical commitment was to say, not my will, but yours be done. That's radical commitment. And it means that what you're facing is quite out of the ordinary with what you desire to face. Mm -hmm. But as the Bible says, he didn't look at the cross. The cross is a station along the way to the destiny. The cross was not the destiny. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So we got to look beyond the things that we are called to face. These are the radical things that come into our lives that are intended to get us to our destiny. Matthew 5, verse 29 and 30 talks about the radical nature of what commitment is. And thank you, James, because I like that. He said, leave those feelings aside because if it's sunny, you don't feel the same. If it's cold, you surely don't feel the same. However you feel is not the way that the Christian life should be operating. Matthew 5, verse 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish, not your church members. Mm -mm. <laughs> Just had to fit that in there. Then for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for one or for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, by the way, you made this reference to Jesus was specifically talking about the sensuality that the Pharisees found themselves in. You see, the doctrine of the, of the Nicolaitans was my spiritual life and my natural life don't affect each other. Mm -hmm. And so they felt we could be involved in sensuality, sexuality, immorality, and my, my, my spiritual life is not affected. The Lord was addressing that in this particular passage. Right. But he wasn't calling them to do their body's physical harm. Rather, he was saying to them, if your mind is not able to be controlled, you've got to make some radical decisions. Right, right. You've got to find ways of controlling your mind. Cut off whatever is keeping your mind from being controlled. The verse didn't say, pray for God to instantly remove the sinful tendencies from our lives. A lot of people say, Lord, now I want to just be very candid. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Lord, take away my desires. Mm -hmm. He will never do that. Right because he gave you those desires. Mm. Desire for food, for sleep, for love, for sex, for anything that has been built into you to be in the right category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when those desires are not led by the right motives and principles, this is where the distortion comes in. And that's what he's talking about here. So these radical changes that are being called for us to participate in, radical commitment comes in these four areas. Let's, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. And I think I just referred to this, but a radical commitment means being willing to sacrifice whatever obstructs our goal. I just made reference to this, but let me go ahead and read it. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, this is radical. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, there it is, lay aside how many weights? Every, Every weight. And the sin which so easily ensnares, or as the King James besets us. I love that word. It besets us. It's like this. It's like this brick in the middle of our living room that we keep tripping over and we don't want to move it because our grandfather owned it. Mm. Right. <laughs> was our grandfather's brick. Well, he's causing his grandson to trip, move the brick. Right. In our lives, there are traditional things that are passed down generationally. We call those uh, inherited tendencies mm. that when we don't cut them off, they become cultivated tendencies. Mm -hmm. And then here's what he says the sin which so easily ensnares, and then only then can you run with endurance mm -hmm. the race that is set before you. Radical commitment also means being willing to sever anything and anyone that hinders our spiritual growth. Some people, somebody once sent a question in Bible Q&A. I'm, I'm living with a guy 18 years. He doesn't want to get married. He doesn't want to commit his life to the Lord. I want to go to church. What should I do? I love him. I said, take the next, next bus in the opposite direction. <laughs> if somebody wants to carry you to destruction and they're giving no evidences. Don't let your feelings mm -hmm. become the reason why you're lost. Cut it off, cut them off. It's better to go to heaven without that person than to go in hell with them. Mm. Third thing, being willing to sever anything or anyone. Second Corinthians six seventeen. therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. We've got to be willing to do that. And what you're seeing right here, this is not the part where 
we are saying, Lord, do this, do that. This is the part of Christianity that you are completely responsible for. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, the Lord are making, the Lord are going to make the changes. He's going to make the changes only as you submit your will, but he's not going to pick up this glass and move it. You got to move it. He's not going to say, I sent you a check and I'll go to the mailbox and bring it into the house. Yes. You got to get up and go. He's not going to say, I, I got a job for you. So bring the job to my house. No, you got to get up and go to the job. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that the Lord will never do. The third thing, what does radical commitment mean? Being determined to push past the distractions to the prize. That's what Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 12 and 14. Mm -hmm. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I was just quoting recently Usain Bolt, the Jamaican uh, runner that broke records that are still standing. And he says, um, there are many people that are better starters than me, mm. but I'm a better finisher. Mm. And he said, don't, don't focus on how you began the race, focus on how you finish it. That's right. And he said, thirdly, win from within, meaning you got to see yourself as a winner mm. before you are willing to wake up seven o'clock in the morning, do your exercises nine months before the Olympics. He was, his coach gave him no rest. Mm -hmm. Before Jesus comes, we cannot rest in making all the changes necessary for our fitness when the Lord comes. Mm -hmm. Being committed to radical change means being committed to delayed gratification over the pleasures of sin for a season. Hebrews 11 verse 24, that's exactly what Moses did. He said, he says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There are some people that said, oh, I want to enjoy this now. And they like that, like that car, like that chauffeur that's trying to get the job. He tried to impress the uh, owner and he drove as close to the cliff as he could mm. without going over and he didn't get hired. Mm. And he said, I didn't, I mean, I showed you how close I could get to the edge. He said, no. I want somebody who's going to stay far away from the edge. <laughs> I'm not putting my life in your, your hands. The Lord doesn't want us to just barely skirt sin. He wants us to cut it off yeah. so that we are not radically destroyed by sin. Radical changes prevents radical destruction. Radical action is necessary, not because God has made the Christian life difficult, but because we and our culture have drifted so far away from God's plans for us. Mm -hmm. The writer said, people often wake up and wonder to themselves, how could I have gone so far away from God? Mm. The answer is always the same, just one step at a time. Wow. Yeah. So what do we do? Now here's how radical change happens. Romans 12 verse one and two. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. You got to present something. Don't say, Lord, I'll give you my prayers. I'll give you my heart. I'll give you my, my, my praise. So many people are praising God with their hands and cursing God with their lives. Mm. This text says, don't praise him with your hands and curse him with your life. He says, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Or as the NIV says, which is your spiritual act of worship. It's easy to say, I praise you, Lord, but I'm not going to keep your commandments. Mm. I love you, Lord but don't expect me to keep your Sabbath. Mm. And we are living in a day and age where there's a form of godliness, all this feeling. Mm. Thank you, James, all this feeling, but no commitment. Mm -hmm. How does feeling overpower commitment? Because they are conformed to the world. But the Lord says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's why when people say my body belongs to me, no, it doesn't. First Corinthians six, verse 19. Mm -hmm. No, you do, you do not belong to yourself. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Mm -hmm. People want to glorify God in the spirit, but don't tell me to stop drinking, stop alcohol, stop carousing, stop watching what I watch, stop going where I go. I'll glorify God in my spirit. Don't ask me to glorify God in my bodies. Well, mm. how can this radical change be affected? Mm. We've got to pray the prayer of David. Thank you for the example. Mm. What did David pray when he radically messed his life up? Mm. He said for God to change him internally first. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Right. Psalm 5110. Radical commitment means asking God to give you the right mind so you can have the right life. Amen. 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 What a blessing it's been to be able to listen to each and every one of you. 
I now have Thursday's lesson, The Need to Persevere. My name is John Dinsey, and uh, pay close attention. We're going to move fast in Genesis chapter 31, verse 11. Uh, Jacob reveals that the angel of God spoke unto him in a dream and said, get everything ready and go back to your uh, family's uh, where they live. It, uh, the land of your kindred, it says in Genesis 31, 13. Now we move to Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. So as he begins to set out, Genesis chapter 32, verse 1 says, So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. So this is already a sign from the Lord. Hey, I'm going to be with you all the way. Trust me. Uh, verse 2, when Jacob saw, him, saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. So now Jacob, from uh, verse 3 to 6, he sets out a plan to send a message to Esau that I am coming. And notice what he says. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. Notice the words that he sends to him, letting him know, I'm coming, but I'm not coming to take over. Jacob, your servant, he's putting himself in a submissive position and letting uh, Esau know, hey, I am coming. I'm not coming here. I'm not coming to take over. <laughs> he's trying to send him a message that I am, I'm not coming to take over. You are in charge. I am your servant. And so this is what he said. Now he says in verse 5, I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Notice what happens in verse 6. Then the, the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is also coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Mm -hmm. So what kind of message is this? <laughs> uh, Esau is coming with soldiers. He's coming with men. And so the message was clear to Jacob. In verse 7, it says, So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels in two companies. And uh, Je he's distressed. He is, uh, he's in fear. Now, this is something to consider. Remember that Jacob deceived Esau. And uh, he had to leave his father's house, his family's house, running for his life. Now he's heading back there. So the sin that he did, deceiving his, his brother, now he's understanding that it does not only affect you, now your whole family could be affected by your sin. We have to take serious consideration when temptation is coming, hey, this could be very serious damage to me and other people. Mm -hmm. So trust in the Lord. Do good and you will be blessed instead of doing the deceptions and sins that could carry not only you, but those you love and put them in serious danger. Mm. So uh, let's go now to um, verse 8. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company, he divides the two. If Esau comes to one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. So he divides the group into two. And he sets before them sheep and oxen and cattle. And, uh, and every time when, as, as Esau was coming, he would say, these are from your servant Jacob. They are for you. So he's trying to soften, the, soften him and prepare him for, uh, so that when he meets Jacob, by now he's delighted. Hey, thank you for all the gifts. And uh, this is great. You know, I'm, you're not coming to take over. I understand. So this is the message he's trying to bring. But he is still afraid. He is still afraid. So uh, Jacob goes to the Lord in prayer, Genesis 32, 11. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, hmm. lest he come and attack me and the mother and with the children. So he's understanding his sin is serious. Look, it could have serious repercussion years later, years later. And he said, for you said, he's now talking to the Lord, bringing to him the promises that he made. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered from multitude. And this is a message for us. We can come to the Lord and present his promises and say, Lord, you promised this. I have been faithful. Please bless me. Please yeah. take care of me. And yes, the promises are there for us to claim by faith, trusting in the Lord. 
And now uh, he sets a strategy to protect his family. As we mentioned, he divided them in two and each one with a message as Esau would come. But we need to move quickly, quickly now to um, John chapter 18. And I'm going to point to you verses 4 through 6 for this reason. You see, the lesson brings out that uh, Jacob gets involved in a wrestling match. Hmm. And the lesson brings out that this wrestling match was with Jesus Christ. And I want to point this out because it appears that they were wrestling for a long time. And uh, Jacob seemed to be, appear to be so strong that Jesus could not overcome him. But you see, uh, look at, look at uh, Genesis chapter 18. I mean, John chapter four, 18, verses 4 through 6. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? This is when he was in Gethsemane. He was praying, and they were coming to take him and arrest him and, and crucify him. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he, what happened? They drew back and fell to the ground. <laughs> so we're talking about Jesus. All he did was talk. And people fell to the ground. Right. Now, this idea that he's wrestling with Jacob and he, he couldn't get loose is because Jesus adapted himself to Jacob to, to prepare him to understand who he's wrestling with and that he needs to appeal for a blessing. Now, uh, I remember when uh, our son Samuel and Caleb, Caleb was about five, Samuel was about eight years old, and uh, we were having a soccer match. I couldn't play my heart out and run as fast as I could. They were just young guys. <laughs> but I had to adapt the, the game so they could have fun and enjoy themselves. And uh, when I saw them trying hard to make a goal, hey, I will let them make a goal. And you should see the joy in their faces. Oh, we made a goal, we made a goal. <laughs> so they, they had to, I had to make it uh, a challenging for them. So Jesus adapted himself in this wrestling match so that Jacob could understand his place. Now remember, uh, previously, previous in these verses, he said, I am not worthy of the least of thy blessings. Mm -hmm. He's coming along the way to understand that God blesses those who have faith in him. And Jacob right. was now humble and he says, I am not worthy of the least of thy blessings. Let's go quickly now to Genesis 32, beginning in verse 22. And he arose that night and took two of his wives and his female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford, a shallow part of the body of water, and, uh, and that they may be crossed over. So he separated himself from the family. And this is verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. This is Jesus Christ. Jesus adapted himself to, to him. And in verse 25 says, Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now this is something powerful to consider because here they are wrestling and wrestling, and it appears that it was a long time. And so Jacob now needs to understand, hey, <laughs> you're not wrestling just with anybody. Mm. So he touched the socket of his hip to let him know. In reality, he's, taught, he's wrestling with Jesus. Oh, Jesus could just touch an arm and it would go limb. <laughs> touch another one, go limb. And basically Jacob could do nothing. But he took him along the way to help him. Now when Jacob realized that his hip was out of, uh, out of joint, uh, he now was holding on. Wait a minute, I've got... I've got somebody here that can bless me. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something about this appeal mm -hmm. that I need to take you to Hosea really quickly. In Hosea chapter 12, verses 2 through 4, it reveals the way that Jacob appealed. And I only have time to read verse 4. It says, yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. Notice, he wept and made supplication unto him when he found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. So here he was pleading, he was begging, please bless me. It wasn't that you're going to bless me or else. No, it was a pleading. He was weeping for a blessing. And so it says uh, in verse 27, so he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob, and he knew the name. <laughs> and he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob because 
but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. He persevered mm -hmm. and God blessed him. We need to persevere with the Lord. We need to pray and persevere and we will receive blessings that we are not receiving because we are not persevering. Amen. Mm, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This has been a powerful lesson. I've yes, enjoyed it. It's it been such a blessing. Let's get some final thoughts as we prepare to close. My day was the divine human combination. And here's the bottom line. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to go to the Lord, be filled mm -hmm. with the Holy Spirit. He will empower us, but he won't force us. We have to take action. Amen. Mm -hmm. My lesson was the dis disciplined will and the will is the, the action of choice. And many times we let our feelings overwhelm us when we make choices. I always tell my wife, don't go by feelings. That doesn't mean feelings shouldn't have a place, but let our feelings be guided and directed by the Word of God. That's right. Thank you. And mine called radical commitment, radical commitment. Now, for me as a pastor, I'm going to appeal to clergy also because this is a very powerful radical commitment that the Apostle Paul talked about. He said, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become, and I use the King James Version, a castaway. We don't want to be a castaway and lead others to Christ. Mm -hmm. Manuscript 161, 1904, this message, it says, and when we seek with such an intensity for the blessing of God as Jacob, we shall receive it. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. It's been such a blessing. My friends, I know you've been blessed and I know that each and every one of us are continuing to learn as we grow and we gain and equip ourselves with the knowledge to be able to understand how to persevere through these crucibles. I just want to leave you with John chapter 15 and verse 5. It says, I am the true vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. We just need to abide and trust in Jesus Christ and he will give us the strength and the power to persevere through through. My friends, we want you to join us next week. We know you're going to be back here. Lesson number seven is coming up. We're going to be dis discussing and studying indestructible hope. God bless.